Hombre, I can't see what this is about. So I've had a bunch of folks ask me, Why torture yourself with season two of the Halo TV show after season one was so bad? And why not a ragging on it if you hate it? Well, let me explain using three magic words. Star Trek, Picard. Paramount, the overlords behind both Star Trek and Halo, miraculously turned around Picard's third season after two lackluster isn't the right word for it, that's an understatement, so instead I'll say two very bad previous entries. With a new head writer, Picard's final season was a banger. The lesson? A good writer can make or break a franchise. Hearing about the writer's shake-up for the Halo TV show, as the last mob abandoned ship before the first season even concluded airing, it gave me some hope. If Picard could improve, why not Halo? fresh blood and a new direction, it all seemed promising. Though the show may not be exactly what we hoped for, surely it'd be a solid improvement, right? Right? Hello there, guys, gals, ladies, and gentlemen. My name is Leipaladen, and now that all is said and done with the second season of the Halo TV show, I've decided to recompose my thoughts as my weekly reviews tended to be somewhat scatterbrained and reactionary. Before we really dig in, though, I'd recommend you check out my previous video essay on the Halo TV show. Link will be somewhere on the screen. If you haven't seen it yet, it gives you a pretty good indicator of my thoughts on the show's first season. You'll probably hear me talk about the gold and silver timelines a lot in this video. For those unfamiliar with those terms, the TV show exists within its own distinct universe known as the silver timeline. In contrast, the gold timeline encompasses all the last 20 plus years of content, including the Halo games, comics, novels, and related media, outside of the TV show. So the actual good Halo stuff, you got it? And just another disclaimer, if you're one of the lucky souls who found enjoyment in season two or the show as a whole, good on ya. I don't want to rain on your parade. Everyone is entitled to their own tastes. But if you're willing to entertain the notion that maybe, just maybe, season two missed the mark, then stick around. As anticipation mounted for season two of the Halo TV show, there was a palpable sense of hope. After season one received a bit of flame from critics and was mobbed into the ground by the fanbase too, it was evident that changes were needed. With the departure of former showrunners Kyle Killen and Stephen Kane, the responsibility fell on David Weiner. You're an adult, grow the f up, this is not that funny, to steer the ship in a new direction. Early interviews with the cast and crew hinted at a shift towards a more faithful adaptation of the beloved video game franchise. Wiener's promises of a grittier tone and an improved vision for Halo suggested that lessons had been learned from the missteps of the previous season. There was a clear attempt to try and win back fans with clickbaitable quotes like, Season 2 will win over the naysayers, or it's more rooted in the source material, and even that the dialogue had improved putting words in the mouth that feel more appropriate for the character. Suck big ass cream. Even Pablo Schreiber, the actor for Master Chief, came out and publicly said he tried to fight the decision for Master Chief to, uh, <clears throat> get it old, with Marquis, which indicated a level of self-mindfulness about some missteps that the show took during season one. There were plenty of signals that pointed to this season hopefully being an improvement, and the team behind it knew as well. Step one to fixing a problem is recognizing that you have one. Early reviews for the season appeared overly hopeful, if not suspiciously optimistic. Those granted early access to review the series had the opportunity to watch the first four episodes, arguably the strongest of the season, which likely contributed to their positive ratings. Notably, only 19 critics at my time of recording this review actually bothered to review the show, compared to the 71 for season one, suggesting a potential disparity or lack of interest in coverage. Though there were likely more critics talking about season two that we just never got to see. Recent revelations from a Vulture article exposed questionable practices within Rotten Tomatoes, a prominent online reviewing platform. 
That article revealed that Rotten Tomatoes relies on a select group of reviewers sourced from an agency called Bunker 15 to generate its critic scores. This agency has been known to influence scores by incentivizing reviewers to isolate their negative reviews on websites that Rotten Tomatoes doesn't check when aggregating its critic scores, therefore ensuring they remain unpublished and do not impact the critic score of a certain film or television show. This casts some doubt on the authenticity of critic reviews and raises concerns about the integrity of Rotten Tomatoes review aggregation. I'd recommend checking Vulture's article about this for more detail. But I think it says a lot about the current authenticity of critic reviews and the recent trend that so many production companies and distributors have taken to make their marketing material about these critic scores. Like it's a badge of honor or something when they absolutely paid for that score and likely don't genuinely reflect critical reception. It's um, critical success, uh, as, as our, our, our PR guy loves to remind us, 94 uh, on the tomato meter. Yeah, because PR guys are always just such trustworthy people, right? Amidst the cautious optimism surrounding season two, there were notable concerns regarding the portrayal of its central character, the Master Chief. While initial reports hinted at Chief's personality in the show aligning closer to his stoic video game counterpart, remarks from Pablo Schreiber threw a wrench into those expectations. Schreiber's comments downplaying the importance of Chief's helmet, asserting that seeing an actor's face was essential for conveying emotions, directly contradicted the traditional anonymity associated with the character of Master Chief. Little did we know that the major gripe almost everyone across the board had with Season 1, which was seeing too much of Chief's face and having him out of the armor for extended periods of time, was actually something the creative team for season two was going to double down on. But the red flags didn't stop there. Oh, no, 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 no. Kiki Wolfkill, formerly head of transmedia at 343 Industries, who had overseen production of season one, had since been promoted to head of IP expansion at Xbox. She was present from day dot on season two as an executive producer, and no doubt had some leverage in the story being told. Part of what's so important to tell in this season is what is John's relationship to the Master Chief? And in some ways, the armor is a representation of the Master Chief. And so what I think we've seen mm -hmm. up through episode seven is John reconciling who is the Master Chief to him. We understand who it is to the UNSC. We now understand what it is to Ackerson. And what we wanted was for John to reclaim that armor and reclaim who the Master Chief is. Um, because the Master Chief is John. Ultimately, it's about Chief reclaiming who the Master Chief is and reminding us that he is the Master Chief. Kiki, for some reason, seems to think that Master Chief and John are two separate people. I think what she's trying to imply is John's relationship with the armor and the importance of what that means. But it's so poorly articulated by her and barely touched on in season two that it sounds like she's talking about the character of Master Chief as a separate entity to John 117. Master Chief isn't some alter ego. Master Chief isn't a separate identity to John, like Bruce Wayne to Batman or something. Chief doesn't necessarily fight as a symbol like Batman. He fights because protecting humanity is what the Spartans were bred to do. It's crucial to recognize that Master Chief is a rank. It's not an independent identity. Chief wasn't always this symbol that Kiki keeps describing. The reputation and status attached to Master Chief were earned through John's actions as a Spartan particularly his pivotal role in destroying Alpha Halo and dealing a significant blow to the Covenant, the first proper W for humanity after a losing streak longer than the average night of playing Halo Infinite ranked. His heroism was cultivated organically through his deeds, not arbitrarily bestowed upon him as the show seems to suggest, even down to his status as one of the blessed ones. Now, I mean no disrespect to Kiki Wolfkill as a person, but I don't think she understands who Master Chief is and her incessant need to make Chief, or John, sorry, because they're two different people now apparently, a more human character to make him some kind of superhero stand-in with dual personalities and deconstruct his character is the root cause for everything that's gone wrong since. This isn't to say I totally dislike the idea of humanizing Chief, but only to a point. Kiki's been on a journey to try and strip down the character of Master Chief, literally and figuratively, since she became executive producer on Halo 4 and had major input on the story of Halo going forward. Just when we thought she was out of the equation at 343, she's managed to hang around and still influence the franchise's trajectory and plug her ideas with the TV show. You'd think after being executive producer for that god-awful Halo Nightfall series, someone would have been like, yeah, nah, let's... So maybe get someone else in. This misunderstanding of Chief's character also extends to his relationship with Cortana. The core dynamic of every Halo game is the Chief-Cortana relationship. Your responsibility is to humanity, not a construct. 
Cortana's more than that. She knows me. However, season one did absolutely nothing to solidify this. When they reunite in season two, it's difficult to feel anything because their previous encounters in season one were mainly just... Cortana. Yes, Chief? I need you to do me a favor. Anything. Stop talking. Can't hear myself think. Well, I can, and you're not missing much. First chance I get, I'm cutting you out. That's not a gamble I would take. I'm not interested in your advice anymore. Chief didn't like her all of last season. He let her pilot his corpse around for a couple of minutes in the season finale because there was no other alternative, and then she got pulled out of his head. They never get a chance to reconcile, yet he's also willing to risk his life to save her in a superbly contrived bit of storytelling, where Chief is not only flying faster in his suit than a Covenant ship. Anyway, that's not part of the point. As you can tell, the foundations for this second season of the show were rocky at best. So how did season two do? <laughs> well... The Fall of Reach stands as one of the most pivotal moments in the Halo timeline. This event not only marks the beginning of the end for the decades-long Human Covenant War, but also holds significance as the first piece of Halo expanded media ever released. Eric Nyland's novelization released on October 30, 2001, a mere two weeks before the launch of Halo Combat Evolved, and remains revered by many as the quintessential Halo novel, and was some people's first ever experience with the Halo universe, even before the games. The Fall of Reach betrays Master Chief and Spartan Blue Team as they undertake a daring mission to capture a Covenant Prophet, intending to use them as leverage for a truce in the ongoing conflict. However, their plans quickly unravel, forcing the Spartans to execute the Cole Protocol and destroy a docked ship to prevent the Covenant from getting their grubby fingers on some vital information about Earth's location. This also includes safeguarding the generators crucial for maintaining Reach's orbital defense systems, which serve as the planet's last line of protection against the encroaching Covenant forces. So the TV show kinda got that part right, but doesn't actually show us any of this defense, per se. The story culminates with Master Chief retreating to the Pillar of Autumn as Reach gets glassed by the Covenant, leading into the start of Combat Evolved. Complementing this, we have Halo Reach, Bungie's final installment in the Halo franchise, which offers a contrasting perspective on the fall of Reach through the eyes of the Spartan 3 team known as Noble. This game provides a more grounded view of the conflict as the Covenant initiates their invasion of the planet with a small offensive force which escalates and spirals out of control for humanity, as each member of Noble team either sacrifices themselves or meets unceremonious ends. The situation deteriorates further, ultimately reducing the once vibrant planet to a cinder in space. Despite our efforts to halt the invasion, it feels almost inevitable. However, the planet's eventual demise doesn't make the pill any easier to swallow. Throughout our journey on Reach, we develop a connection with the planet and its people, imbuing our fight with a sense of purpose. Despite knowing the outcome, the marketing slogan was from the beginning, you know the end, after all, there remains a glimmer of hope that our efforts are not in vain. The TV show fails to capture the essence of what made these two narratives compelling. It neglects to instill even the slightest shred of hope that the battle for Reach isn't futile. How can viewers invest emotionally in the fall of Reach and the potential loss of key characters when figures like James Ackerson convey a defeatist arrogance from the get go, contradicting the resilience and can-do attitude typically associated with humanity in the Halo universe's gold timeline. The betrayal of Reach and what we see in the show is narrow, sterile, dominated by dead, dull, and frankly boring concrete corridors and extras clad in military attire with no personality. Consequently, when the planet is glassed in episode 5 of season 2, it fails to evoke any significant emotional response. In contrast, both Nyland's novel and the Reach game offer a rich tapestry of environments on the planet. In the game alone, players traverse diverse landscapes from farmlands with frightened civilians to the Visegrad relay where personal tragedies unfold. The journey continues through icy, snow-capped regions and bustling urban centers, each populated by characters with depth and humanity. Civilians desperately defend their homes, soldiers fight against overwhelming odds, and once thriving urban hubs become grim, collapsing battlegrounds. There's a symmetry that we can see between Reach and Earth that makes us want to fight for this fictional, yet familiar world. Throughout these experiences, Reach emerges not just as a setting, but as a character in its own right. A home for the Spartans after being taken from the ones they once had. A place steeped in history and significance. The meticulous world building and attention to detail in portraying Reach's varied landscapes and its people's struggles contribute to its profound impact in both the novel and the game. And it's implied right from the franchise's beginning in Combat Evolved 
that Reach was all humanity had left except for Earth. Force deployment, weapons research, Earth. I understand. When do we ever hear any kind of line similar to that in the TV show? That's the neat thing. You don't. The stakes are so poorly set up and there's no desperation. It's not like if we lose Reach, Earth is next. In this universe, we don't know how many other planets humanity has left before it becomes Earth's turn to get glassed. Further to this, the battle for Reach itself is not really a battle at all, with the showrunners admitting they couldn't do it justice from the outset because of budgetary constraints. As much as we would have loved to spend four episodes on it, we couldn't afford to. <laughs> Which makes you wonder, why even bother trying in the first place? If you can't do this monumental event justice, what's the point? What we're left with is a feeble attempt at recreating the chaos of battle with explosions happening haphazardly like it's a Michael Bay film or something in sparsely populated urban areas against hordes of Covenant elites that run towards the protagonists like they're clumsy zombies or something, and we see a grand total of one wraith, leaving us questioning the authenticity of the whole affair. Cast your minds back to the point I made earlier about the show's misleading marketing. Half the posters for season two illustrate Jimmy Rings in his armor, either admits to battle that is clearly happening on Reach, and another that shows him collecting the dog tags of fallen marines on a planet with lava oozing out of its burnt surface. Kind of like it's supposed to be Reach post-glassing or something. But what do we get instead? One episode where Chief and two members of Silver Team aren't even in their armor. But again, the best we get are a few minor skirmishes with a handful of marines and a grand total of one scorpion tank defending Fleetcom. We've seen this before on Halo 3 ODST and at least they were smart enough to blow the bridge in that timeline. There aren't any other Spartans present either. Compare this to the scope and scale of the battles we saw in Halo Reach, the tremendous loss of life and the stakes at play, and you can start to see why maybe, just maybe, people were disappointed with this. Oh, but Halo Reach is a game. Of course they have more time to characterize the planet. Yeah, and the TV show had two seasons and close to 16 hours of runtime. Double that of Reach's estimated completion time if you were playing on normal difficulty. Difficulty. And this is still the best that Paramount and the showrunners could do. Maybe if they weren't so focused on their shitty B-plot fetch quests, Reach's fall could have been given the time it deserved and the setup it needed in order to be satisfying. The worst part of this all, though, is just when the show seems like it's going to take things in an interesting new direction, it stops just short of making the most of it. In the gold timeline, Chief wasn't technically even on Reach's surface during its fall. So having him involved in the TV show this time around is a captivating twist. Just as the battle starts to take a promising new direction with Chief's involvement deviating from the gold timeline, the excitement fizzles out, Chief is sidelined unconscious for the remainder of the conflict, leaving us wondering why they bothered to include him at all. Arbiter spares his life at Marquis's request, only for the next episode to open with him being shot at again. So why bother to spare them only for some of Arbiter's other goons to come along and try to kill them later? Because they need to get saved by Quan. Ah, yes, of course. And ultimately, what was the point of all of this? To take us to a Western planet to do a filler episode with some vaguely philosophical talk about what Spartans are and having Chief mope around for an hour. If you needed any more reason to dislike this show, just remember, they dedicated an hour to our characters talking and moving aimlessly from scene to scene on some random unrelated planet and Soren's side quest to find his son, but the fall of Reach barely gets 40 minutes. That could have been an entire season's worth of stories right there, showing the Spartans desperately trying to hold back the Covenant, but instead, we got 40 minutes. What should have been the epic fall of Reach complete with Spartan 3s, the UNSC fleet engaging in a thrilling ship-to-ship -ship battle, and heroic sacrifices, including a Spartan kamikazing a Covenant supercarrier, is instead relegated to the very last episode of the season, with Onyx basically being Reach in everything but name. From the heightened military presence to the underground forerunner structure that we find Dr. Halsey investigating, I swear I've seen all this somewhere before, but I just can't quite put my finger on it. Season 2 hinges on a number of schemes devised by Oni Admiral Margaret Parangoski and her crony James Ackerson. Oni really are just one bad plot point away from becoming moustache-twirling villains that are devious for almost 
no logical reason and seem to revel in causing trouble for the sake of it. Why the focus on the internal squabbles of Oni and the UNSC, you ask, when that was barely prevalent at all in the Halo games? Well, it all boils down to budget constraints. You can't produce a high-octane action series if your budget from Paramount consists of 37 rupees and a can of blue sunkist. So what's a production team to do? Spare those action sequences and fill the runtime with endless two shots of people talking instead. But here's the kicker. If the writers were truly keen on injecting some political intrigue, a la Game of Thrones into the mix, to save some of their budget from being poured into the action sequences, they could have gone about it with the Covenant instead. I'm just saying, their complex religion, societal hierarchy, heck, it's practically a political drama waiting to happen. Just look at Halo 2 for proof that it can work. The foundation for a gripping political saga is right there. Yet instead, we're left with Oni and UNSC bureaucrats bickering like a bunch of schoolyard kids and again, twirling their moustaches, undermining our heroes at every turn. Drama for the sake of drama is not good drama. That's why fucking soap operas exist. I'm here to watch Halo, not Bold and the Beautiful. For some context and why this aggravates me so much, we're in the final stretch of the Human Covenant War here. Humanity is on its last leg and losing planets and people stupidly fast. So why are officers like Ackerson and Parangoski engaged in such needless, petty levels of bureaucracy, choosing to undermine humanity's defense, and by extension its well-being, and some of the best soldiers they have? Why are they happy to let humanity's military stronghold and one of the most populated inner colony worlds go so easily? Why make humanity the bad guys in a story about genocidal aliens trying to wipe us out? You see where the writers of this show maybe don't understand what Halo is about? I can't grasp this weird fascination that the 343 era of Halo has with making humanity the bad guys and subsequently making Chief go rogue. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but... <clears throat> um, Halo 4, Chief gets told off by Captain Del Rio, who really is just a dickhead for the sake of it. Give me that chip. Sir, respectfully, go fuck yourself up the ass. And Chief goes rogue. Halo 5, Chief gets some vague notion that maybe the UNSC were keeping information about Cortana still being alive a secret from him. So he goes rogue. Season 1 of the Halo TV show, Chief gets orders to kill Quan for some reason, decides not to, and goes rogue. And the same thing happens in Season 2 again. Chief and his team get gaslit by Oni, and he goes rogue. How many fucking times are we going to keep doing this same song and dance? You can make Chief an interesting character without making him insubordinate all the time. You've got to do some serious mental gymnastics to make any of this work. And the moment you give Parangoski and Akerson and Oni's plans even a couple of minutes of critical thinking, the whole thing just crumbles. Let's start with Stage 1 of this plan in quotation marks. Ackerson maintains a level of dodgy secrecy and a sus attitude that ultimately contributes to Chief going rogue, which is exactly what Parangoski seems to be trying to avoid. Part of the reason she wants Chief dead is because he's becoming harder to control. So instead of filling Jimmy in on part of his plan and not treating him like an idiot, maybe telling some half-truths and stuff, you know, taking inspiration from the show they seem to be eager to mimic, Ackerson would rather outright deny whatever Chief has to say, despite knowing it's true and acting as such. Antagonizing the highly influential war hero is probably not a good idea. James Loops finds elites on Sanctuary along with some kind of cryptic covenant jamming frequency, saves a marine called Perez who saw the whole thing all before the planet gets glassed. And to top it all off, Chief believes he saw Marquis. The first three episodes of the season are him trying to prove this and that the Covenant are in fact on reach as well. Chief had the elite blood on his armor and Perez as a witness. Furthermore, Chief has got Mjolnir armor on. Everything he sees should be recorded. It's been established since the first Halo game that even Marines have cameras in their helmets. Hell, most military and law enforcement agents have cameras on them now. That's why Live Leak exists. <laughs> Don't look that up if you're under 18. Why doesn't a super soldier in the 26th century with armor that is comparable to an entire starship and price have a fucking camera somewhere to prove his claims? But what about Perez, right? Surely she'd corroborate Chief's story. Nope. Perez doesn't even say anything because she thinks her story is too wild to believe. She wasn't forced into silence by Oni, the UNSC, or Ackerson to try and make Chief look loopy. It wasn't out of some kind of survivor's guilt that she lived while the rest of her team copped the L. She just didn't speak up. And so the rest of this bullshit plan swings into motion. Ackerson successfully convinces Silver Team into believing there were no elites on Sanctuary or Covenant on Reach, and that Jimmy is mad, and manages to persuade 
persuade Kai to split off from the rest of the team she grew up with, has fought alongside for decades at this point, to train a new generation of Spartans and abandon her home to the Covenant, leaving Silver Team for dead as far as she's aware. I would have given anything to be there in Reach. You know that. But you aren't. I had orders. From whom? Parangoski. From Ackerson. They're responsible, Kai. For Reach. For Vanek. The Covenant's responsible. The Covenant didn't take our armor. Yeah, okay, that... I'm sorry, but Kai was like the second Spartan in Season 1 to take out her emotional inhibitor, hormonal pellet thing. It was shown that she was somewhat insubordinate during Season 1, as if she's really going to fall for this and follow orders like she does so blindly in this show. Later, when Chief is revealed to still be alive and has infiltrated the secret base on Onyx, Ackerson breaks his own narrative. John escaped from Reach. How did that happen? I don't know. How did that happen, Kai, when everyone else... You're wrong! He's here, now! On this planet, in this facility, why is he here? Yet Perez is still alive and no one's asking questions about her. We know the Covenant attacked the Visegrad Relay for a very specific objective. To cover their assault on Sword Base where they captured one of the artifacts. Chief took Silver Team to the Visegrad Relay on the suspicion that the Covenant were there. The comms array on Sanctuary went down just before the Covenant attack. Visegrad went down a few days ago. Covenants on reach. Ackerson, Keyes, and Oni tried to convince Silver Team that there were no cubbies at Visegrad and make Chief out to look like a nutter. But later, when talking to Kai, Ackerson admits that the Covenant were at Visegrad. How is Kai not piecing this together? Then we get to the capture of Cortana, which was meant to be a pivotal moment, but let's be real here, it required a cosmic alignment of coincidences to pull off. After Chief got bonked at the end of Season 1, Cortana, who had been piloting his corpse, still no explanation for how Chief was medically dead yet brought back to life somehow, and interacting with Forerunner artifacts, is removed from his head off-screen between seasons. In this timeline, Cortana was originally a neural implant. Handing Cortana over to Parangoski, who is faced with the prospect of Chief's gradual decline and potential demise, Cortana pleads with Parangoski to ensure his survival, offering to fulfill a task in return. But why does Parangoski desire Chief's demise despite his invaluable contributions? Vaguely, we're told it's because he's becoming increasingly difficult to control despite Chief's pivotal role in turning the tide of every battle he's in and returning two highly coveted Forerunner artifacts that could lead to the discovery of Halo. Instead of letting Chief perish on the operating table, Parangoski orchestrates an elaborate scheme with Ackerson to leave him and most of Silver Team stranded on Reach to meet their end, while painting Chief as a martyr to fuel their propaganda machine and inspire the next generation of Spartan 3's training on Onyx. It's really fucking elaborate. But, oh wait, it, it doesn't stop there. Parangoski's galaxy brain plan, aside from keeping Cortana locked up to run simulations on how to beat the Covenant, is to leave Cortana in a bunker on Reach and let her get captured by the Covenant and report back to her with the location of Halo. A gamble that is so dependent on a series of serendipitous coincidences that it could easily have gone south. How did Parangoski know that the Arbiter and Marquis would stumble across Cortana buried deep in some concealed bunker? If Soren and Halsey had just been a tad quicker in Episode 4, they could have snatched Cortana from right under their noses. And let's not forget the Covenant's knack for reverse engineering technology, as that's literally how they got as technologically advanced as they they are, by reverse engineering Forerunner stuff. If they got their hands on Cortana, who's to say they wouldn't have cracked her open like a piñata full of valuable intel? Oni's plans to wipe out their fleet, the location of Earth, of Halo, the whole premise of the first Halo game was to prevent Cortana from falling into enemy hands for exactly this reason. The protocol is clear. Destruction or capture of a shipboard AI is absolutely unacceptable, and that means you're leaving ship. Get Cortana off this ship. Keep her safe from the enemy. If they capture her, they'll learn everything. Only lucked out that Cortana ended up in Marquis' bumbling grasp. After all, she's not the sharpest tool in the shed. If the Arbiter had an ounce of common sense and didn't listen to Marquis' plea to return to high charity, Parangoski's high-stakes gamble would have blown up in her face faster than a plasma grenade. And even then, Cortana carelessly leads Marquis, the Arbiter, and the rest of the Covenant to Halo anyway, which just so happens to be somewhere in human space. Cortana reports back to Parangoski while they're hiding out on Onyx, but surely, surely, if the Halo was this close to charted human space, someone would have found it by now. I understand space is big, really, really big. But judging from how this battle is set up and staged, it seems like the system that the Covenant have arrived in with Halo is not that far from Onyx. They have probes or something else out there. Hell, they even have radio communication and they're able to ping the Covenant fleet once they arrive. So they know where to dispatch the Condors to. 
but their sensors don't read the giant metal fruit loop that's hanging above them, probably teeming with life signs? The final stage of Oni's plan is to use the Spartan 3s to deliver a data spike that supposedly compresses the fusion reactors of a Covenant ship, triggering some kind of chain reaction powerful enough to wipe out an entire star system. With this little USB, they went full fucking hold on maneuver with this one, eh? If that sort of technology existed, why would the Covenant not be kamikazeing starships into systems populated by human colonists and just detonating them on the spot? Why waste resources and time on glassing a planet when you can destroy several of them with one fell swoop? More importantly, how is Oni and humanity able to develop this technology with a minimal understanding of Covenant ships and how they work? We're hundreds of years behind the coveys, technologically speaking. Our main weapon against them is to fire a chunk of metal at their ships really fast and hope it does something. Meanwhile, they have energy shields, plasma weaponry, faster ships. So if we're able to devise this go-go gadget fusion bomb thingy, then why didn't the Covenant and their scientists think of it first, you know? If the Covenant takes the halo, we won't live to fight another day. There will be no more days. But you're the whole reason that the Covenant found Halo, because you gave them Cortana. Oh god, I give up. Parangoski made this whole situation worse by interfering with her backward ass, smoothie brain, not smooth brain, <laughs> don't be mistaken, smoothie, liquid, little bit of pulp, but primarily liquid consistency brain plan. If Marquis didn't have Cortana, she wouldn't have found Halo because it's established that she can't use the Forerunner MacGuffins after season one without Jimmy Rings' help for some reason. You do know what will become of me if I can't yes. find And what do you suppose will become of you? If you were to use the artifact to project yourself back to the Halo, you could determine its location in the stars the same I way- I can't. I tried to go there in my mind. I touched the artifact and nothing happened. I can't go there without him. And it's likely that if the Covenant caught onto this, she would have been executed because she no longer has any use. That elite priest is frothing at the bit to kill Marquis, and I'm sure plenty of other Covenant are feeling the same. Hell, even the Arbiter doesn't like her, which opens a whole new can of worms about why he's suddenly so enthralled by her and why Marquis is absolutely devastated to see the Arbiter die when the dude almost killed her in Episode 5, but that's not the point. Characters just do shit in this show because the plot demands that they do, and not for any motivated reason. But by giving the Covenant Cortana, Parangoski inadvertently saved Marquis, the Covenant's primary human asset, and only major connection to Forerunner technology. It would have been easier if she just stayed out of it completely. Also, how does Parangoski know what Halo is? Why does she assume it's a weapon? The only people who should realistically know are Julian Ovoid here and future Empress of the Covenant, Christopher Walken. They're the only ones who have seen Halo in some capacity. You know, I miss when Halo was this wondrous megastructure that we uncovered the purpose of as we progressed through the first game and story, you know? Adding some level of mystery to this ancient place rather than telling us outright from the start and spoiling any suspense that came from it. Funnily enough, all it takes to actually win this fight against the Covenant First Fleet of Solemn Accord is for Kai to kamikaze a Covenant assault carrier and miraculously the UNSC get the upper hand. The last few episodes seem to imply that there was no chance the UNSC could engage this Covenant fleet in combat and win. This is the most powerful fleet we have. They won't last the day. They basically left Reach to die for this reason. Yet once you get rid of that assault carrier, the UNSC just start winning, apparently. We have the upper hand. Wasn't the ratio of human ships needed to take out one Covenant ship like three to one or something? Once Akerson uncovers Parangoski's plot to wipe out the Covenant fleet, he suddenly develops a moral compass and refuses to sacrifice his Spartan 3s. So you're happy to let your dad die and let Reach and its population of several million all burn and the Spartan 2s, including Cobalt and Silver Team, but a handful of Spartan 3s that you've been helping to train for, what, a few days? Maybe a week at best? Is too much for you now? These Spartans are my life's work. What the fuck? Where did this come from? When was Ackerson ever involved in developing a new Spartan program? Nowhere in the series do we see his connection to this endeavor prior to the reveal of the Spartan 3s in episode 5. This revelation feels like it was pulled out of thin air, shoehorned into the plot with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer. Sure, it's something we as more familiar fans of Halo see in the Gold timeline, but again, 
If you're new to Halo and this show is your introduction to the series, how would you know any of this? Why did Paramount feel the need to distance this show from the source material they're meant to be adapting, only to fall back on said source material so often to provide context to things that they didn't bother setting up? It's a redemption arc so forced, it's like trying to fit a warthog down that doorway in Silent Cartographer. You know the one I'm talking about. And what does this all amount to? Ackerson bends over to get his Halo ring shrived the moment Chief gets a hold of him, and Jaquad Cylinders beats Parangoski by literally just just ignoring her. What kind of villains are they? There's nothing for our heroes to triumph over and no satisfaction to be had at the end of their storylines. I think the peak of humanity's stupidity in this show, however, is demonstrated when the Flood show up. I have my issues with their depiction. For early stages of an infection, this is fine, I guess, even if there's not much else done to indicate that the Flood are more than just generic zombies. If we even got to see a few instances of the Flood collecting bodies to be repurposed as biomass, or some different mutations other than just the early combat forms, like those seen in the Halo Wars sequel comic Something Has Happened, where some humans have their bodies repurposed to become crude carrier forms, that would at least give an indication that these creatures have a level of intelligence and are able to mutate their bodies to fill specific specific needs and whatever the infection needs at that point. But that's not why I'm mad at him. I'm mad because this supposed top secret Oni facility on Onyx that has no maps or any kind of records associated with it, a greater military presence than Reach, it seems, doesn't have any kind of security. The Flood and Jimmy Rings can just roam around freely for hours. It's clearly shown that they have security cameras in this facility, so why aren't they doing anything about the flood outbreak that's happening and all these people who are showing obvious signs of some form of infection? Or were the black veins boils on their faces and profuse amounts of sweat not obvious enough? Why does a xenobiologist touch an unknown, newly found sample? You'd think Oni would be hiring the best of the best, but Janine here has the IQ of a wet sock. Why does Oni not have some form of quarantine facility in this space, especially when their scientists are trying to open an ancient and potentially dangerous underground structure that could lead to Lord knows what? Why does humanity not have any level of common sense in this show? I get most people are preoccupied with the Covenant fleet, but shouldn't there be some Marines on standby or a few Spartan 3s you can dispatch to figure out what's going on with this random case of people standing around motionless for hours on end? Speaking of the Flood, I didn't even mention the writers setting the stage for Miranda to cure Halsey's Flood infection despite the franchise's namesake, Halo having to be created to stop the flood because there is no cure. That is a line in the sand that you do not fucking cross. I've also got a line here that's highlighted and just says, stupid marine captain. <laughs> Humanity's worst enemy in the TV show is itself, and not even as an ironic twist, which might have been smart and an interesting commentary on humanity. No, this just screams of incompetent writing that wanted to inject some extra drama to drag out the runtime of the show. Arguably the biggest mood killer for season two and something that I have seen universally panned, even by people who think this show is all right, is the B-plot with Soren, his wife Liera, and their son Kessler. This has got to be one of the most irritating fetch quests and it's made even worse by Soren's sudden pivot from being a badass lone pirate who was a former Spartan, now leader of the rubble, to suddenly wanting to leave all that behind and be a Spartan again. Let's break it down. So, Soren abandoned the Spartan 2 program due to a deformity with his arm that occurred due to his reactions to one of the many augmentation processes that the Spartans underwent. How did an augmentation fuse his fingers together? Don't ask questions, just watch the show. He abandons the other Spartans when he's still young, taking his armor with him and going off to become the leader of a colony of pirates called the Rubble that resides within and around several meteorites that were repurposed to house people and act as a spaceport for all kinds of illegal goods, including human trafficking, apparently. Soren is at the top of his game. He's got a family and a wife living in luxury, and he goes out on daring missions every now and then. He's living a dude bro's dream. It's established early on in season two that Soren wants to find Dr. Halsey after she went missing at the end of the previous season. It's assumed that Soren wants to find her and get revenge for what Halsey did to him, messing up his arm, taking the life he could have had when he was just six years old and indoctrinated into the Spartan program, all pretty understandable motivations. There have been rumored sightings around the galaxy of Halsey, but he eventually falls prey to a very obvious trap and is taken back to Reach for... 
some reason. As another random part of Ackerson's plan, he kidnaps Soren for a purpose that never really gets elaborated on and locks him up in a room with Halsey while the planet Reach falls. What was the purpose of setting up this elaborate reunion between the two of them, only for them to die a few hours later, as far as Ackerson's aware? Was it to spite? Halsey uh, and say, look, here's another one of your failures? Or was it because Ackerson didn't have the balls to kill Halsey himself and instead went to the trouble of kidnapping Soren and thought he was going to do it? It begs more questions than answers and serves more of a purpose in bringing all of our characters together for the events of episode four than any actual smart, thought out narrative purpose. Kessler, Soren's son, also gets shipped off on a craft that's leaving the rubble with his mother and Quan ditching him. So because of their stupidity, we get this whole plotline where Soren and Liera have to go looking for him, eventually realizing that he's on Onyx, coincidentally the same planet that Jimmy Rings has to get to later on in that season. Kessler is being trained as a Spartan III, but not like the rest of the Spartan Threes, where they're just adults in glorified Stormtrooper armor. It's a bit confusing. He's closer to the Spartan Twos from this timeline where he's being trained from a young age. Soren, after coming all this way to rescue his son, pivots to thinking that Kessler needs to be trained up as a Spartan and put through the same horrific torment and hardship he did in order to become the man he's meant to be or some bullshit, but then snaps out of it a minute later when his wife starts shouting at him. Like, what? <laughs> In the same breath, we also discover that Soren wanted to find Halsey because he wanted to go back to being a Spartan, as it gave him purpose in life. I'm sorry, but the program that permanently disfigured you, that you couldn't have been happier to get out of, and now you want to come back? Why? It, it doesn't add up. There is nothing done throughout the series to foreshadow this revelation. If Soren maybe acted happy when he got the chance to be back in combat with the Covenant, if he expressed some kind of sadistic joy amidst the battle and realizes that he misses the thrill of gunfights and working with his fellow Spartans, you know, it's something obvious like that, it wouldn't have come completely out of the blue. Or, you know what, I'll do one better. Let's rewrite Soren's arc this season, keeping the writer's original vision of getting Soren back into the Spartan 2 program while making it more fitting with his established character. Let's say he gets kidnapped by Ackerson and Oni, right? Ackerson wants him because he's the only Spartan 2 who's managed to survive the augmentations while still suffering a severe injury from it. Ackerson wants to put him under the knife so when he gets round to augmenting his Spartan 3s, he can avoid making that same mistake. At least set up the fact that Ackerson is working on the Spartan 3s, because in the actual show it comes out of nowhere. While taken to the underground Oni bunker on Reach, the same that Halsey is in, the Covenant attack and Soren makes his escape, eventually coming face to face with Dr. Halsey. The duo begrudgingly decides to work together to escape, and Soren sees firsthand the destruction caused by the Covenant. Human casualties left and right with no thought given to women and children. Not just the men, but the women and the children too to the Covenant we're all unworthy and deserve to be eradicated. In these casualties, he sees his wife, he sees his son, seeing Reach engulfed in flames where he spent most of his childhood and teenage years growing up, upsets him greatly. Maybe the rubble isn't that far away from Reach or something, and seeing the Covenant wipe the floor with the planet despite being so well defended and totally not abandoned in a day like the actual show, Soren realizes he can't just stick his head in the sand anymore and remain blissfully ignorant to the Covenant threat. If Reach falls, his family, not just Kessler and Liera, but the rubble, the only place he has left that he can call home, will be next. Seeing the other Spartan 2s like Chief, Riz, Kai, Vanek, he realizes that they make a proper difference, not just on the battlefield where the Spartan 2s win almost every altercation, but morally as well. He sees how the Spartans inspire the soldiers on reach. Soren could fall back into his position as a talented leader with a lot of charisma, directing squads into battle with his unorthodox guerrilla style tactics that catch the coveys off guard. Once Vanek dies, there's a new opening in Silver Team and Soren steps up to the challenge and dons Mjolnir armor once again. Boom. There you go. Hire me, Paramount. Actually, actually don't do that because this show is beyond saving. Also introduced this season is the TV show's version of the Arbiter. Yay! Surely they won't mess up this fan favorite character too, right? <laughs> Admittedly, this version of the Arbiter is different to the one from the games. Instead of Thelvatomy from Halos 2, 3, and 5, it's Var Gatanai, a character invented entirely for the TV show. And for the most part, this version of the Arbiter is an interesting deviation from the one seen in the games. He's very eager to prove himself after being shamed for reasons unknown. Legit, I tried looking it up and not even Halo Wikipedia has any idea why this happened. And that's kind of the problem here. The show loves to take a dump on the gold timeline every chance it gets and tries to distance itself from it as much as it can. You kind of need to have 
played the games to even know what the Arbiter's deal is, because next to nothing is done to establish who he is. The first time Var is even called the Arbiter by name isn't until Episode 5, over halfway through the season despite seeing him on several separate occasions before that. Nothing is done to set up why Var became the Arbiter, and what the significance of that role is in the Covenant's hierarchical pyramid, just that he's done something shameful. Like what, did he forget to flush the toilet in the capital ship, and left a steamy one in the bowl for the next unsuspecting elite officer? Who knows? It's established that killing Master Cheeks is going to lead to Var's redemption, so why spare him at the end of episode 4? Why is he so beholden to Marquis's every beck and call when he also says that the only reason she is still alive is because of him? Actually, speaking of, how the fuck is Marquis still alive? She got shot in the chest by Kai in the season 1 finale by an M6G Magnum, which was one-shotting elites moments before, and fires a 12.7x40mm semi-armor-piercing high-explosive round that would have scrambled her insides. We even linger on her body for quite a substantial amount of time after the Spartans leave, where she He's neither blinking nor breathing. Even if the Covenant did have some kind of medical magic to resuscitate her, there's no oxygen going to her brain. If she's not dead, Jim, she's a vegetable. And if the writers had any level of common sense, they would have kept her that way. Even your leading actor had a problem with this character along with the rest of the fan base. The whole forbidden Romeo-Juliet romance thing was such a bad idea, yet they seem intent on wanting to continue it. If anything, Marquis is given more to do this season and essentially starts the Great Schism early and gets set up to be a replacement for the real Arbiter, even branding herself with the Mark of Shame. Yeah, bet you didn't think of it that way, huh? Chief seems completely whipped on her too, choosing not to kill Marquis on numerous occasions despite knowing she's off her rocker and willing to use Halo to wipe everyone out. If they control the Halo... They will annihilate humankind. And if the humans control it, they'll annihilate the Covenant. This is all they know. These two sides are not the same. The Covenant are the ones who started this war and have maintained a genocidal campaign against humanity for decades. Sure, Oni and the UNSC have been portrayed as doing some pretty shitty things in the TV show, but I'd prefer them over the squid heads wanting to annihilate my race. If Chief had some balls, he'd tell Marquis this during their little joint dream sequence or again when they're face to face on Halo. Or better yet, finish what Kai started and put her down because she's clearly out of her mind and willing to wipe out everyone. You said you wanted peace. When they're gone, peace is all that will remain. And silence. I can't let that happen. She is a liability, and a dangerous one at that. It's not like Chief is opposed to killing other humans, as that's what the Spartans were originally made to do, stop insurrectionists. But Chief isn't the only character with a severe case of mental hindrance, because Cortana has some of Chief's memories and saw his visions from Halo, uh, from Season 1. She makes a holographic image of Halo convincing the Arbiter to find it, and reject the Prophet's orders to return to High Charity. He doesn't question why this is happening, or think it's some kind of trap made by the human-made AI that they just brought aboard the ship, Literally no critical thinking done by this man at all. It just begs the question, why bother doing an alternate take on something if you're just gonna do it worse? Halo 2 establishes who Thalvatomy is, why he was shamed. They explain what the rank of Arbiter means, and there are hints dropped throughout our time playing as him that indicate the Prophets are lying and not giving Vatomy the whole picture. Because Vatomy was so faithful to the Covenant religion, it's not until he's betrayed by the Brutes and has it explained to him by the Grave Mind and Guilty Spark that we finally get that amazing payoff at the end of the game. The show skips over all of that potentially amazing character development, that whole arc, by having Marquis spout some vague bullshit about her own prophecy and that the Prophets are liars. Her source? Trust me, bro. Also, does anyone else find the Arbiter's armor in the TV show to be just kind of shit? He doesn't look all that different from the other elites in the show who all have the same kind of dark blue or grey coloured armour. Say what you will about the bright colours of the Covenant in the games, but at least Bungie knew how to make certain characters stand out. The Arbiter's silver ornamental armour that was more jagged and looked older stood out amongst the sea of brightly coloured, clearly more sleek and technically advanced Sangheili combat harnesses. And don't even get me started on the lack of purple for the interior of the Covenant ships. I have no idea why the production team thought making this show as drab and desaturated as possible, especially when Halo has historically had some very brightly coloured characters and environments. Even the darkest and grittiest game in the series, Reach, made the Covenant, their architecture and designs pop. 
The Covenant as a whole aren't really given the level of respect that I think they should have gotten either. Instead of being a capable military force with different races filling specific roles within their military, the show focuses very heavily on elites. Instead of being the swift, precise and agile commanders of the Covenant military, comparable to a Spartan in their speed and strength, they're seen rushing clumsily into battle and getting shot down in seconds, hoarding through corridors or across a bridge like a bunch of zombies from World War Z, throwing their lives away recklessly. Isn't that more like how the brutes are shown in the games? Just big angry bullet sponges with minimal armor who charge into battle once they get fired up? Isn't that what the grunts are there for as cannon fodder? Look, regardless, I believe the Covenant has been underrepresented in the last two seasons of the show. The glimpses we have seen indicate a lack of effort from the TV show's team to make them compelling or even effective villains. Like his counterpart from the Gold Timeline, Colonel James Ackerson is Dr. Halsey's rival and responsible for the creation of the Spartan 3 program. However, there's some key differences here that I think undermine the Spartan 3s that we see in the TV show compared to what came before, and makes them less interesting as characters. The Spartan 3 program was Ackerson and Oni's attempt to replicate what Dr. Halsey had done with the Spartan 2s, but at a fraction of the cost and in greater numbers. While the 2s underwent rigorous genetic and physical augmentations that had a high failure rate, the Spartan 3s had primarily chemical augmentations with a higher chance of success, but with other potential drawbacks in the future, such as psychological instability. They had similarly intense training to the Spartan 2s, even having Chief Petty Officer Mendez, who trained the 2s, and Spartan Kurt, who was also a Spartan 2, train them. In the TV show, Kai seems to fill the shoes of Kurt and attempts to train this next generation of Spartans as best she can. Supposedly. The trouble is that we never actually get to see her train this next generation of Spartans. She just barks orders and talks down to them at every opportunity while they play Firefight on their Apple Vision Pro headsets. Yet we're also expected to believe that Kai would get all emotional and gladly sacrifice herself alongside these Spartans, but she won't stay behind on Reach to fight with Riz, Vanek, and John, the kids she grew up with and her immediate team. Yeah, cool, all right. The thing about the Spartan 3s in the original Halo lore, however, in the Gold Timeline, is that they were in many cases the unsung heroes of the Human Covenant War, frequently sacrificing their lives in the hundreds to prevent the Covenant from creeping further into human space. Often sent on suicide missions, the Spartan 3s were highly classified with the general public not knowing of their existence. Some of their victories were credited to the Spartan 2s to boost public morale. The 3s were children as well who were enlisted at a very young age, in fact way too young to make life-changing decisions, and had their parents or immediate family killed by the Covenant. They were vengeful, unstable, and essentially a bunch of drugged up kids sent in to fight and likely die. All the while, they never got any kind of recognition for this. And I feel like the TV show squanders that underlying darkness and tragedy for something more generic and was clearly rushed to the finish line because the universe building in this show is so poorly done and it ultimately comes off feeling like a bad attempt at fan service. In the TV show, instead of enlisted children, they're former Marines like Perez who want to do their part to serve after losing their family and friends. So at least they got that part right. Though how does Perez even become a Spartan 3? She's a comms officer who couldn't hit a target to save her life at the start of the series, and even accidentally shoots a chief. Clearly she's not the image of a perfect or even adequate soldier, quite frankly. So why waste all these resources on her for expensive chemical augmentations and armor? That's if the Spartan 3s even had augmentations done because nothing is ever shown or stated outright to imply this. Perez, despite her inexperience on the battlefield, is seen as being one of the better Spartan 3s. So God knows how low the bar was for the rest of the folks becoming Spartans. They could have recruited Terry the janitor. How about the chef? You can be a Spartan and you can be a Spartan and you can be a Spartan. Everyone's a fucking Spartan now. At least by training the 3s at a young age in the gold timeline, they were better prepared and Oni's investment in these soldiers was somewhat worth it. Because despite being expendable, at least they weren't fucking hopeless like they're clearly depicted as being in the show. Half of them go out like absolute duds. Their training is also a total joke. The Spartan 3s are coached entirely in VR, and they're just shooting smoke. There's no palpable enemy or anything that we see, just some blue laser bolts that come out of nowhere and pick people off randomly. I guess the show's budget ran out before they could add in a couple of grunts or something, huh? It's established that they haven't even used Covenant weaponry before. You ever fire a plasma rifle? No! You never forget your first! Frankly, it's an insult to call these jumped up Marines Spartan 3s because they're not even close. The fundamental issue I have with the Spartan 3s lies in the narrative message surrounding them. It's not the armor that defines a Spartan, 
Rather, it's the intense training, the unbreakable bonds formed through shared hardships, and the exceptional circumstances that made them extraordinary. Or perhaps it was the Forerunner DNA that apparently influenced Halsey's decision to abduct and transform them into Spartans, making them all little chosen ones in their own right. But let's park that egregiously stupid idea for now. The Spartan 3s fall short compared to their predecessors due to their lesser training and camaraderie. This shortfall is particularly evident in Chief, who is frequently reminded of his exceptional luck or supposed talent for altering fate by flipping coins. He doesn't need his armor to be heroic. He doesn't need it to be a Spartan. Anyone can put on some armor and pretend to be a Spartan, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be one. Yet despite these accolades, Chief spends the entire season desperately trying to regain his armor. So what's the moral here? That Spartans are more than just their armor? Then why subject Chief to getting his shit pumped every episode when he's without it? Using the Spartan 3s as the centerpiece of Chief's personal journey that questions the essence of Spartans feels like a misuse of this intriguing part of the Halo universe. The Spartan 3s in the Gold Timeline, while described as cheaper imitations of the Spartan 2s, played pivotal roles in the war. It was never suggested that they were less than Spartans. But the TV show seems to undermine this point and their significance for the sake of propping Chief's character up. Before we do move on, however, I want to touch on the involvement of the Forerunners in the creation of the Spartan 2s. In the TV show, it's described that Dr. Halsey was influenced by DNA remnants left behind by the Forerunners in an underground cave on Onyx to initiate the Spartan 2 program, finding different kids with that same genetic mutation. Halsey's discovery of this mysterious DNA led her down a path of unethical experimentation on children, motivated by her desire to unravel the secrets of the Forerunners and their connection to humanity. All because these kids had some genetic marker that she had no idea how it could even be used. This depiction diverges significantly from the established gold timeline, where the Spartans were developed out of necessity to counter the escalating insurrectionist threat endangering humanity. Personally, <laughs> I hate this idea. It transforms the Spartans into Halsey's personal evolutionary experiments rather than a strategic response to defend humanity from internal or later external threats. In the Gold Timeline, Halsey screened candidates for the Spartan 2 program based on the robustness of their DNA and repair enzymes, not some magic forerunner DNA bullshit. Furthermore, Halsey initially wrestled with ethical dilemmas and emotional turmoil, struggling to detach herself from the suffering inflicted upon the abducted children and their grieving families who received Flash clone replacements. The TV show makes Halsey out to be a psychopath who wanted to further her own quest for genetic knowledge of the Forerunners, and not a morally complex character who did what she had to do for the benefit of mankind. Coming out of Season 1, I was hopeful that we would see an improvement to the music of the TV show, especially when news broke that Bear McCreary, composer of some other really great sci-fi television like the Battlestar Galactica reboot, was on board as Halo's composer. Well, sort of, but I'll get to that. McCreary was one of the highlights of the Terminator spin-off show, The Sarah Connor Chronicles, composing a soundtrack for it that echoed some of the elements that Brad Fidel used for his scores in the first two, and only good, Terminator films. And for Battlestar Galactica, he used a really unusual assortment of instruments from around the world, like the Taduk and plenty of choir and percussion. Bear also wanted the score of Battlestar to use instruments as ancient as possible, which sounds similar to the directions given to a certain other composer about a science fiction property, huh? Joe had told me that the emotions for this piece should be ancient, mysterious, and epic. So getting into season two of Halo, I was expecting Bear to really bring his A-game like he usually does, tap into that mindset he used while composing Battlestar and consider the musical character, the timbre, of the original Halo games like he did with Terminator. The new opening theme for Season 2 I think is a definite improvement over Season 1's, and the callback to Halo 2's version of the Halo Monk chant with that rising choir is excellent. There are maybe a few seconds where we hear some of the melody called Respite from Halo 2's soundtrack, and a subtle reference to the Halo theme in the first episode when Chief scales the rock face with his grapple shot. Well, that's straight up. The Nubian Ibex can scale an 80 degree slope. Over. What? What? Five, 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 five. 
But that is where the references end. Unfortunately, similar to Sean Callery, the composer for season one of the TV show, McCrary just doesn't capture that quintessential Halo sound in my opinion, and that baffles me especially a composer of his caliber who has managed to do that before. I love Bear McCrary. The guy has composed some incredible music for games, television, and film. His resume is probably one of the longest in the entertainment world, but season two's soundtrack, if you listen to it on its own, you would be hard pressed to identify most of it as something from Halo. Instead, it's a bland replication of generic sci-fi action tunes that could have been plucked from any number of productions in recent years and feels like it was made by a committee or something. And the more research and digging into it than I did, I suddenly realized that that is exactly what happened. While McCrary is credited alongside Marty O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore for composing the theme tune and themes within the show, the bulk of season 2's soundtrack was actually crafted by McCrary's entertainment company, Sparks and Shadows, utilizing their own in-house team of composers. And suddenly everything clicks. This soundtrack wasn't a singular person's vision shining through, it was the musical equivalent of painting by numbers. I can just imagine the editors or producers saying, we need an epic orchestral theme for Master Chief. The composers just went, I right, hold my beer, and picked out all the most epic and cinematic sounding libraries in contact, smashed them all together, including the goddamn Inception horns like we're still living in 2010 or something. The composers at Sparks and Shadows didn't even try to give this soundtrack its own distinct identity like McCrary did with Battlestar Galactica, which honestly sounds more like Halo music than the soundtrack of the TV show does. And there's clearly no attempt to emulate the distinct tone and qualities of the music from Bungie's games like Gareth Coker, Curtis Schweitzer, and Joel Korolitz did as the composers for Halo Infinite, or even Stephen Rippey as the composer for Halo Wars. Scarcely any of that tribal-like percussion. Choir is rarely heard, and no recognizable themes or leitmotifs get used aside from the ones I mentioned earlier, despite being plenty of perfect opportunities to use them. We get half the season on Reach, and not once do we hear that iconic, sorry, I had to say it because it is, tritone motif that is constantly echoed in the game's campaign. They don't use devils, monsters, or any other identifiable themes for the reveal of the Flood. Just generic horror music. For the record, I'm not saying that you need to copy what Marty and Michael did to have a good Halo soundtrack. All I'm saying is, paying a bit more attention to Halo's music and really listening to what makes it special probably would have led to a better outcome. Furthermore, the style and instrumentation of Marty and Michael's compositions for Halo aren't copyrighted, and I think that's the thing that these composers don't get. Halo's score is not really massive and epic in the general sense, like most other science fiction properties. It's not all about the heroic brass and strings doing arpeggios in the background like so many cinematic film scores do these days. Halo's music was a mix of multiple genres, from rock to various types of world music, sometimes with clear references to the percussive beats of certain African and South American and Asian cultures. There are references to the music of the Middle East, of course, Gregorian monk chant, which goes back to the Middle Ages. You've got elements of traditional classic or film score composition in there too, of course, but Halo's music was never defined by just that one genre. It's a fusion of various styles. Indeed, Halo's music stands out precisely because of its ability to achieve greatness within limitations. Unlike many cinematic scores, Halo's music often embraces a more subdued approach, favoring the cordiality of a few instruments over a grand orchestral spectacle. In the early days, particularly with the first two Halo games, Marty and Michael worked with rack synthesizers from the 90s and a Kurzweil keyboard, leveraging the talents of additional musicians to enhance the synthesized sounds with vocals or string performances. The beauty of Halo's music lies in its resourcefulness, as the composers at Bungie crafted memorable themes and melodies despite constraints such as a small budget and limited time. Rather than relying on an abundance of resources, Halo's soundtrack demonstrates that creativity and innovation can flourish within limitations, producing compositions that have left an indelible mark on gaming and entertainment culture. And I certainly can't say the same for the soundtrack of the Halo TV show. To those who don't like the TV show, you can at least rest assured that season three is yet to be confirmed, and with good reason. Season 1 and 2 were likely greenlit at the same time, with a third season dependent on their critical and commercial success. But the other spanner in the works is that Paramount is likely to be sold sometime in the near future. So Season 3 and the future of the show 
is up in the air. I think ultimately the reason season 2 of the Halo TV show is being better received than the first isn't because it's a massive improvement, because it's not, but because our expectations were levelled by season 1. Now those who hoped for a decent show have either given up or are so resigned that they're ready to embrace season 2's nonsense with open arms. I think as Halo fans, as fans of entertainment in general, we've just been subjected to so much mediocrity in recent years that our standards have taken a nosedive. Just think about the amount of crap that's come from Hollywood and the AAA gaming scene in the last decade and tell me that hasn't honestly lowered your expectations. That's why I wanted to make this bloody long video, because I knew folks were turning blind eyes to issues with this show and settling for less than what we could have had. The Halo fanbase, or community rather, is like a house divided against itself. You have people who fall into either the Bungie or 343 camps. You have the ongoing debate over Sprint in the Halo games. You have smaller factions like those Spoonfeds who are stuck in the mid-2010s and think that the series peaked with Halo 5's enhanced movement and, frankly, dreadful abilities. These various factions always clash. You see it on Twitter, no big surprise, the YouTube comment sections, various forums, etc. But amidst the chaos, there's one sacred ground where most fans find commonality. And that's the story of Halo. Halo isn't like Call of Duty where most people pick up the game, skip the campaign and head straight to multiplayer. Halo campaigns are special in some regard because almost everyone who loves the multiplayer also loves campaign, or at least has some level of interest or respect for it. These are cherished narratives. People love the story, they love the characters, Chief, Cortana, the Arbiter, Keys, Halsey, Johnson, Lasky, Buck, Noble Team, and so on. Even characters like the Didact, who didn't get their due in the games, still hold a special place in fans' hearts. So what was the purpose of further splitting an already divided community with this show, and doing it over the story, no less. Surely Paramount, Microsoft, and 343 knew going into this that changing established characters, or downright erasing some of them, or killing them off just when they were starting to become good, like Captain Keys. I'm still so pissed off about that. Or revealing what Halo's purpose is before anyone even sets foot on the damn ring. They're messing with the core principles and events of Halo's story and doing a new take on something that's just ended up being worse than how it was done the first time. Of course, it's going to be divisive. Now we've got another faction of people in this already split community. I want to pose a question to you all. If the Halo TV show was a mostly faithful adaptation of The Fall of Reach or some other book or game in the series, if the characters and their personalities weren't needlessly changed, do you think Halo fans would be as disappointed and divided as they are now? Do you think we would have yet another widening rift in the community between those who do and don't like the show? The Halo TV show could have been the live action adaptation to really rally people together, faithfully bringing the Halo stories we know and love to live action, while also appealing to a broader audience of new fans who maybe haven't played the games. A unifying force, bridging the gap between diehards and newcomers alike. Believe it or not, you can appeal to that broader audience that 343 are so intent on chasing, while still maintaining some level of artistic integrity and keeping in line with what's been established earlier. But then again, I don't think that was ever the intention going into making this series somehow. It's from this lens that I see the TV show now. I genuinely question its reason to exist when its sole purpose seems to be to divide and iterate poorly on something that came before while doing it worse. The show fundamentally misses the mark on what makes Halo great, even the simple narrative pillars. Whether it's with the characterization of Master Chief, turning him from a straightforward hero that players could project themselves onto into a poorly developed whinger, or it's a misunderstanding of the conflict with the Covenant, instead depicting a desperate war for humanity's survival with the UNSC and its soldiers as heroes, it paints them as the secondary villains. The showrunners seem hostile to the idea of showing the UNSC in a positive light. The only time characters are in the right is when they're disobeying orders. What we see of the UNSC's top brass and decision makers shows them as incompetent or at best indifferent about the war and the soldiers who are fighting and dying for this war to save the entire human race. This approach feels like an apology for depicting characters who support the UNSC, whereas the games, especially those made by Bungie, betray the UNSC and us as the good guys. And for good reason, we're fighting a religiously tyrannical collective of genocidal maniacs 
contact aliens. Not every story needs to be artificially complicated with bureaucracy and political intrigue. You could have a solid story that is just good versus evil, or just general poor writing, like how Quan can step in and using her schizo cave drawing knowledge, solves the Forerunner Connect 4 puzzle in that cave on Onyx, completely going over the heads of a supposed expert Xeno scientist who's been researching this stuff for months, and the smartest mind that humanity has ever conceived. And don't even get me started on all this mysticism bullshit with Quan and her ancestors, a plot thread that should have been glassed like her home planet Madrigal. Microsoft faced plenty of challenges in getting a Halo movie made during the series' peak popularity under Bungie over a decade ago at this point, and they were understandably very protective of their new Cash Cow franchise and wanted to ensure it wasn't ruined. But this shift from being overly cautious to relinquishing control of it entirely and farming it out to a bunch of incompetent corporate storytellers who likely haven't played the games, actually they've admitted as such that they haven't, or understand what makes Halo so special, you've got to ask yourself, was that really the best way to go? Was that really the best deal that they could have gotten for Halo? Because frankly, I don't think it was.